Hey, hey, hey. Oh, nice t-shirt. Looks like you've been hanging out with Ingmar. <laughs> yes. Yes. How are you, Exile? I'm calling from I'm Miami. Cool, man. Looks like sunglasses are in. I, you know, I only got these, these clear ones, you know, so, but you guys are wearing. Uh, how's Bitcoin Miami been for you, man? It's been great. It's been great. I had the opportunity to meet uh, some cool people from the wider Bitcoin ecosystem, people from the sovereign community. That's where I got this, this beautiful shirt. Um, yes, learning learning a lot, honestly, and, and getting to know different people from the not only Bitcoiners, but also people that are really loving sovereign and that are hearing all of the innovation that's happening. So really a great time. Yeah, man. Cool. So uh, go for it. And take 35 minutes and, and let people know, uh, you know, about, about your project and how it's intersecting with uh, what we're implementing on Sovereign. And after that, we'll come back and I'll ask you a couple questions and we'll hang out a little bit more till the top of the hour. Sure. Sure. Thank you, Excel. So, so yes, Babelfish or Babelfish, depending on uh, your pronunciation. Um, you know, it's actually a cool story for the name. And it's a good way to explain what it does. Um, so if you're a sci-fi fan, may, you may have heard about a book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And in it, uh, there's this fish that you plug into your ear, and it helps you communicate with any creature across the galaxy. So it's a translating device. And so we call this project Babelfish because we realized that um, there's a lot of uh, fragmentation in the stablecoin space. We've been seeing this for for a long for a, a long period of time. I was hearing some of the previous conversations here, fascinating conversations, by the way, about the need to create also uh, crypto backed stable coins because you know that's what we need. And there's a lot to talk about that about that. But I am a sovereign, uh, and I want to make this project better. And like me, there's there's thousands, and soon there will be hundreds of thousands and millions, um, to get to millions, to get to the first 100 million users, uh, we need to make it really, really easy to get into the space. And we know that stable coins are that familiar currency gateway that makes it really easy to onboard users into the decentralized economy. So how do we bring stable coins over to Sovereign? We have great projects right now that are uh, Bitcoin backed stable coins uh, that are doing a great job on that are rootstock native and then we have for example over a hundred billion dollars of stablecoin liquidity um say in ethereum and in binance 80 percent of that liquidity of the so 80 billion it's it's from fiat backed uh stable coins one is opaque and the other one it's uh following the guidelines and then the other 20 percent it's being competed away by many different small projects so this creates many issues uh, from from risk, risk being the main one, um, to also you know increase centralization so it defe defeats the purpose of what we're doing in, in a way, um, and um, yeah, I would say that the biggest risk is uh, idiosyncratic risk, but there's also an issue when it comes to um, usability, um, both from a user interface point of view and also by a market efficiency point of view. So this is something that people from the community at Sovereign have been discussing for a while. I think even before Sovereign was created, we saw this problem of stablecoin liquidity being fragmented across the different flavors of stablecoins that you have in cryptocurrency. So if you go to a, a, a centralized exchange or a decentralized exchange and they accept a few different stablecoin flavors, um, you will have, let's say, BTC against uh, USDT or BTC against USDC or BTC against DAI. And then what that is creating, you may know it, but that is basically fracturing the entire combined dollar liquidity. It's being divided over those three pairs. So that creates a lot of market inefficiencies when they're supposed to have the same dollar pair. All of these stable coins are competing to really do the same thing. Um, now that problem is becoming, um, it's being multiplied right now as we go into a multi-chain space. So because as we go into a multi-chain space, you have the, not only do these stablecoin flavors continue to be incompatible between one another, even though they're all supposed to be $1. Now, when you bridge the same stablecoin brand that you have into a different chain, and then you want to exchange it 
uh, for uh, for the same stablecoin um, in a different exchange in that chain, um, but it turns out that they use different bridges. Now you're based, that doesn't work either. So basically you have fragmentation of flavors and then you have fragmentation of, of bridges. So for us, we don't see really stable coins. We don't see, uh, we don't see colors in stable coins. We don't see uh, flavors in stable coins. For us, they're all just $1. Uh, we see them as a temporary um, solution that we need to onboard a lot of people into the decentralized economy. We think it's one of the most exciting areas, the pegged asset category in the crypto space. I would say it's as exciting as Bitcoin. Um, it's gonna be, it's really an exciting thing to be in. So we started discussing sovereign members and members from um, the Blockchain Whispers community as well, and members from different communities uh, from around the world, many of whom um, I've met here as well. I've been fortunate to, to meet different members put a face to the pseudonyms. Um, and we realized, okay, we should just aggregate all of this stablecoin liquidity that we have in Ethereum or in Binance or even in Avalanche and any other EVM compatible chains out there to begin with. So we take a simple pool, we accept USDC, we accept USDT, we accept DAI to begin with. We take them, we create a meta stablecoin from them, we bridge that meta stablecoin over to Rootstock to be used as sovereign. Um, that's that's what we proposed. And then basically we have, we can bring all of this available $100 billion plus liquidity available in these EVM chains, seamlessly bring it over to sovereign while at the same time hedging the risk in a basket. So you're not only using Tether, you can, if you have Tether, you're hedging it with USCC and DAI. If you have DAI, you're hedging it with Tether and USCC and all of and, and, and so on. But not only that, what Bubblefish really does very simply, and this is something that wasn't possible to do up until a year ago, now we have lending markets. So stable coins are now paying over 10% in most DeFi protocols. USDT is paying, for example, over 10% at Sovereign. So we're gonna take the collateral in the parent chains and we're going to be lending it out in the best lending protocols that the community will vote on to decide, okay, where should we lend the collateral that we're bringing over? And then we're going to be taking the yield that we will be earning in the collateral sort of as a bank does, but instead of keeping it to ourselves as a bank does, we're going to use it to buy Bitcoin insurance for the community. And so it's a very simple uh, product that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it needed many things to happen uh, for it to, to occur now and to, to have such a simple solution. Chief amongst them is, is having a protocol um, like Sovereign, a community, such as Sovereign giving giving their support to, to allow Babelfish to have a proof of concept, um, but also evolutions in lending markets, evolutions in, in just the entire space. It's fascinating. Um, and so we're going to have to have a token sale. The whole reason to have a, a token sale that we are going to be doing um, on the week of the 21st. We've been pushing it uh, many times. We just want to make sure that once we have the token sale, we can have the product completely integrated in Sovereign as well we don't want to we want to make sure that that it works the way that things at sovereign are working and, and you know to 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 do things with purpose so so we expect that the first sale will happen the 21st um and then after the first sale once that is complete um or within 48 hours um we will go to the second sale and then the token generation event will happen by the time that the, the, the both sales are completed and why that's important is that we can have a governance uh ready to go from launch because we do not really want to make all of the decisions about where are we going to be lending um or which stablecoin should we start accepting or rejecting um or what should we do with the bitcoin insurance there's a lot of cool experimentation that 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 will need to take place a lot of research and development and the best way to do that it's with the community so so we're going to be starting it right now with just an even distribution amongst USDC, USDT, and DAI on Ethereum, plus BUSD on Binance, evenly distributed. But then we need governance immediately to start saying, okay, let's add this one, so let's go to this other chain, and where should we lend, where should we not lend? And what we're really excited about this project, it's where it can take us, uh, together with Sovereign, together with the wider Bitcoin ecosystem, as we build on Bitcoin Layer 2 and Bitcoin Layer 3. Um, once enough people, once Bubblefish really um, 
is successful proving that such a simple product can work. And if we get to have a sufficiently large pool of Bitcoin insurance, then we can start doing really cool things. Um, I know that uh, in sovereign funds, there's also like a bounty for for uh, for stable coins, crypto backed. I would love to discuss more uh, with the sovereign community, included the, the Babel Fish community there. Perhaps if we get to have, gov once we have govern, if we if our governance can make a vote um, before the hackathon is over to be able to to be involved um, in that and support it, we really want to get even more active in that insure in that in that in that area as well. Um, but yes, I think that's basically the main the main the main objective of Babel Fish. It's a very simple solution that is doable today, that can absorb stablecoin liquidity from other chains while keeping the lending markets in those chains healthy because we're using the collateral, bridging it over to Rootstock, which we will also use to buy the Bitcoin insurance. And then we can, we can start uh, learning more uh, about the whole ecosystem and creating, creating standards um, that will really create a healthy ecosystem and also enable uh, not a winner take all, but rather enable, you know, um, creative people from around the world that may not have the, the connections or the resources to do a good stablecoin organization to try and experiment. And so long as there is demand for those projects um, that we can find, we should be able to onboard them. And um, yeah, I think everybody that is working on the Babel Fish protocol, again, it's a, it's a group of, uh, of, of pseudonymous people, but that comes from Sovereign, that wants to help Sovereign, and it's bringing different communities as well. Very creative, very decentralized, and we really have high expectations also to help uh, to help facilitate um, the whole point of stable coins is to facilitate, you know, the, the marginalized as well. So once we're sufficiently large, here in Miami, we've been meeting a lot of uh, um, organizations that do the on ramps from traditional on ramps um, across Latin America um, and in Africa finding ways not to unramp because we will not be issuing our own stablecoin. But when it comes to off-ramping um, or perhaps doing peer-to-peer -peer trading uh, between the stablecoin markets that we have, there's a lot of cool innovation that can start to happen. And I think that's what makes Babelfish really cool. It's, it's uh, you know, we don't see we don't see difference between stablecoins or just a dollar for us. We want to encourage um, R&D in the space and we want this to be uh, decentralized innovation. Um, so. So yeah, really happy, really happy to to be having the opportunity to build this uh, with everyone, and I think we're really going to have an amazing impact from from what I'm hearing from the people around here. Is um, Babelfish money is chain agnostic then in that sense? I mean, we're implementing it here on RSK on Sovereign. Uh, Babelfish money is something that that uh, could be implemented uh, elsewhere on other chains. Yes. So that's a great question. Someone actually, I think, asked um, on Twitter recently. So yes, the whole point of Babelfish is to be uh, a multi-chain solution. Um, you know, Sovereign is our proof of concept. And then if it's successful, they're very successful. We will take, for example, XUSD, which is our meta stablecoin. We could take it elsewhere. But the priority right now for the project, and then we will see how the roadmap evolves. The priority is to be to bring stablecoin liquidity from to rootstock with uh, non-native rootstock stable coins uh, but yes it is possible and it's something that's on the roadmap that then we can help for example um, bitcoin layer 2 native stable coins if they want to port over um, and be used in different chains that they could also use our system if there is demand for them absolutely can cool. be done. so so let's talk about let's then move into the uh to the fish token launch that's going to be happening on Origins as the first token uh, after Sovereign that will be launched on, on Origins. Why don't you talk a little bit about, about that? Um, something specific. I don't like to talk so much about about uh, about about that, but I guess, you know. Um, well, I guess yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit difficult here, OK? You know I like yeah. everybody. Uh, and I'm a very, very, you know, friendly person Good. in our community. Uh, but I also like to to attack to attack, uh, you know, attack the hard issues. Um, right. And that issue is essentially around the preferential, what some people see as the preferential treatment for the blockchain whispers community. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just going to talk totally from my own personal point of view right here. I've never heard of blockchain whispers. Mm -hmm. I've been involved with Sovereign for five months. 
I hear people arguing on our forums and in our channels that blockchain whispers, you know, uh, made sovereign happen. So I'm really, really curious about what blockchain whispers actually did from from your uh, perspective uh, for sovereign, uh, because I don't see them in any of our Discord channels. I want to know who is blockchain whispers and why is it that they have, uh, you know, first uh, first day sale opportunity um, for for the launch of your token. Yeah, cool. That's a great that's a great question, and we we had a lot of debate about this. Um, so tell me who fish. they are, man, and what's their history? How did they how did they get hooked up with Sovereign? How did they get hooked up with Babel Fish Money? Uh, if I'm clueless, a vast majority of our community is clueless. Okay. Sure. So uh, sure. So we had so this is really this is really a, a great question, and we had a lot of debate about this um, when Babelfish first launched. So Babelfish, I guess the first tweet was just uh, I don't know uh, less than two months ago, and now we have over three thousand active uh, Discord members and close to two thousand followers, and a very active community that's in, you know doing a lot of cool art and also programming, etc. So blockchain whispers is just this community that includes, I don't know, I would say there's probably over 200,000 members and it's just one of these many communities that exist in, the, exist in the crypto space. So it's interesting, people from our parents' age, uh, people in the ages 60 plus, uh, they would tell us, never mix friends and business, bad idea. But today what we're doing, it's creating and reinventing money with online friends. So. If we want to have successful projects, we need to have be part of communities that are large and that trust in each other and that join each other in different um, projects going on in the in the in the space. You know, across across the R and D and and different projects. I don't know if I'm still online. Yeah, cool. Blockchain Whispers is one of these projects. They've invested in different projects. For example, I don't know if I can disclose all of the names, but they've invested in algorithmic stable coins. They've invested in insurance protocols and they've stuck with them even you know after there's like exploits or there's you know like something some something something bad happens. They've proven to be a community that that, that invests not only in the long term but that also brings talent. It's such a diverse community from around the world that it brings a lot of talent. So many people in sovereign right, team wait, wait, right wait, wait, now. Wait, wait. This is really cool, really cool propaganda. Who okay. are these people and what do they do? I don't mean they're people. Yeah. What's their names? What does blockchain whispers do? Yeah. Right. For the community. What is their place in the ecosystem? What do they do? Do they write code? Do they make investments? Who are these people? I've been in Bitcoin for 10 for 12 years and right. I've never heard of blockchain whispers. So please tell me what do they so do? They, <laughs> so they so so I wouldn't class it. So it's a community, right? So it's not one name. It's hundreds of thousands of names. There's over, I would say, like quarter of a million people members. Um, Blockchain Whispers in itself, it's just a community of people that are in there to get signals from from someone called D and someone called Y. But besides that, many friendships have happened through that system, through that community. So it's a community that started there. Um, and then basically Give me some examples. The, okay. The only place I've ever heard this name is involved with sovereign. Okay. What are the things that this community has done? What are the projects that they've signaled on? Uh, what, what are the projects that they've been in, in yeah. involved with? Please. So one relevant, so one, so one, one good project was uh busy YX. Uh, so that was a good signal. I think it was busy YX and they got exploited recently and the community basically decided to believe in them and stick with them. But one that really matters for Babelfish and that it matters when you know, he reached out uh, to some members of us and he said, you know, we really want to support this. We, many of us, you know, were investors in Sovereign. You know, we like this project. How can, and, 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 and people want to participate in this project. I'm participating in this project. I'm on the Blockchain Whispers community as well. Still, again, what is, their what is their path? Hey. What is their path? What are the other projects, please? Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. So the two projects, so the two projects that I am mentioning, Exile, for example, not ours. Are, Prior to us, what has Blockchain Whispers been successful at signaling? Yeah, so BZXY and Fay Protocol is the most relevant for Babelfish. So they really believe on stablecoin innovation for the wider crypto community. Fay Protocol. I don't know if you're familiar with Fay Protocol. It's just an algorithmic stablecoin, okay. and that has backing by Andreessen Horowitz and Polychain Capital. So. Fay protocol is the one that really called our attention 
that's when I spoke with, for example, B and Y, which are sort of like leading this project. This is the one that really convinced me. There's many communities like this in the space, but this one, when he reached out to me and he's like, listen, but we invested in Faye Protocol, you know this, we're sticking with them. Um, even after the, you know, the snafus that happened. I in the still don't get why it is they have a preference over sure. holders where it is that you're launching your token. Sure. So that's I was just explaining who they are and other projects that you that they've been in the in, they've done in the past. Now, when it comes to preference, right? Um, by being part of this large community, it really helps to jumpstart and create a lot of the hype. So, Sovereign hasn't spent uh, Bubblefish hasn't spent any marketing money. This is all a community. But yet, Bubblefish, I'm here in Miami and I'm hearing about Bubblefish everywhere, right? So. We're lucky because we're we're taking Sovereign's community, but also Babelfish's community. I saw this cool Venn diagram, and then in the middle you have uh, Babelfish. Um, I use I did we did some someone did some um, data analysis comparing how many people from Sovereign's Discord were in our Discord um, like three weeks ago, um, and it was just about twenty percent of Sovereign members from the Discord channel. Um, so that's the value that it's being created right now. All of the excitement, all of the noise, much of it is coming from Sovereign, but a lot of it is coming from Blockchain Whisper. So what do they do? It's like it's like asking, um, you know, what does Anonymous do? You know, you cannot really know what do they do. You cannot really know who they are, but it's a wide community, and just like them, there's many. Um, and why are they getting why are they getting uh, this initial deal? It's because many of them are already part in our community, helping from marketing to. Uh, to community management, um, but even though they're getting in first, they can only they can buy less because it's such a large community. As I mentioned, over probably around quarter of a million people in this specific group, uh, we limited the maximum that Blockchain Whispers members can buy to two thousand per wallet, uh, whereas the public sale is three thousand per wallet. Um, and um, in the public sale. As soon as the token sale is complete, it's 50% immediately liquid, right? Um, we believe that people that are getting it uh, on the second sale or people that are getting the airdrop understand the simplicity and the beauty of the project that we want to build and will hold and understand the value of the governance to really do cool stuff with, with, with uh, stable coins and on Bitcoin as well. Um, but yeah, they have that benefit at 50% vests um, immediately, whereas blockchain whispers it doesn't, it just best linearly over 10 months. So we really think that, you know, it's uh, it's very, it's impossible to make everyone happy. We see the consequence of this at the United Nations, um, but we tried our best. Unlike most projects, unlike most projects, it's true. And unlike most projects, we actually opened up to the community to get their feedback on how to do it. I was laughing with you, not at you. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, but I we're trying. Wonder, I, I sometimes find it amazing that even two people can get along. You know, it's like there's there's what is it nine billion people on the planet? And that's from from my point of view nine billion different universes. It's amazing that we can even share uh, a single language with each other, let alone uh, <laughs> organize. Uh, I, I I I think that's what's amazing. The organization is happening, and credits also to to you, Excel. I think you you've been very helpful to organize many things, most in particular this Sovereign. But yeah, I was, I was actually speaking with someone here in Miami that, uh, yeah, because Bagelfish translation device and communication, maybe in the future, I think by the end of this decade, we will just communicate in memes. So you're having an argument with your wife or your girlfriend and you just push a song, right? You don't, maybe we won't need words to communicate anymore. And that's how we will begin to understand. It's not about words. I, ho it's I, about I, I hope that we still need bodies for sex though. I'll tell you that much, you know, I'm just like, yeah. I'm, yes, I hope so too. I'm with you. <laughs> you better <laughs> being a Latin lover. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, so, so the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, overall. So, let's talk about some numbers for 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 stable coins. You know, in terms in terms of volume, what is it we see in the market? Uh, what do you see as a prediction for this year? There's a lot of hype around around stable coins. I think it's. Uh, you know, uh, NFTs have have people's mind share at the moment, but stable coins are entering the dialogue. Uh, what sort of volume do you see across all chains, across all exchanges uh, happening this year uh, and project that for us uh, a little bit further forward? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
so I guess going back to around 2018, back then the total um, stable USD stablecoin float out there or stablecoins issued um, was about four billion, I think, in 2018. It was tiny, um, and then it started growing really fast. And then just from 2020 to 2021, over the past year, it's grown 10x. Um, so we've had the fastest growth ever uh, in stablecoin issuance. What we've seen from 2018, which is kind of like um, when since I started sort of researching the space to now, um, it's just uh, suddenly it clicked that, oh, wow, we have lending markets now. Suddenly, like people figured out um, this recipe that you can, you know, it works, for example, if you want to take a loan, it's not a taxable event, or, you know, like just to make markets more efficient to go long sh or short. These markets are becoming more evolved. I think that as institutions get um, also um, uh, deep in to Bitcoin, we will see legitimate, stable, legitimate quote unquote, stablecoin issuers um, like USDC. Um, grow even faster because these stable coins will be needed for them to do um, trading in the markets. Um, so it's at around 100 billion right now, but then all of these stable coins, it's 100 billion issued, but then you take them to DeFi. So then you, you're locking $1 um, on compound and then you get another dollar, from, you get a compound dollar and then that compound dollar, um, you take it to curve and then you take that curve uh, compound uh, dollar and you take it elsewhere. So um we have a lot of systemic risks in the space that is something that i am concerned but yeah we're kind of like making this that's kind of like the nature it's kind of like against against bitcoin's core value and uh, this was also kind of discussed in the in the event here you know like austrian economics like um how much do we need leverage in the space um i think that it does help to find a uh, fair market value and it helps uh, uh create innovation and grow the space but there is a lot of systemic risk um, and I think, yeah, so in terms of, uh, issuance, I think we're going to, I think it's quite likely that by this time next year, we're going to be already at, 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 at 1 trillion, um, stable coin, um, stable coins issued directly. And once we have 1 trillion, 1 trillion in stable coins issued, then we have, then we're talking about a real economy being built on the decentralized economy. Like that's the minimum that we would need in terms of dollars. And then you multiply that one trillion by all of these different protocols in DeFi and CFI happening, and then you have uh, something really exciting, but also a lot of systemic risk that we need to be aware of. I think we uh, we're going to have a lot of surprises. What do you um, think those some, systemic risks are? That's what I hope that together with the governance, we will attract a lot of people that can help us um, value uh, what a stablecoin is worth or isn't and uh, what what are the parameters that we should have in the baskets um but there's uh there's different risks there's risks of uh from from uh you know well, compliance. let's talk about cbdc's right do you see cbdc's as being one of the the competitors or or not to stable coins that's also a great question i think so if we're talking usd stable coins i think i think that that America, America, or uh, or the Treasury, or the or the Reserve, which is not federal, nor nor does it have a reserve, but they have a catch twenty two moment here with Bitcoin. So the yuan is rising. So they they, they there's nothing they can do about it. China is rising, um, and America at the same time is printing more than it's printed ever, um, and so that's inevitable. So how do they remain competi competitive? Um, competitive. They need to have also their own CBDC, one that represents a bit more freedom. They both have control. They're both, you know, um, state surveillance. But, you know, I would rather have an American, personally, I would rather have uh, an American CBDC than a Chinese CBDC, at least today. Um, now, the catch-22 here is that if they knock down Bitcoin, then all of the stablecoin innovation, which is happening around the dollar, will dissipate because at the end, we're all here for Bitcoin um and uh if they let it continue then they may have you know private issuers you know they completely lose monetary uh policy power to private issuers um and so i think that's kind of like the the the, the, the dilemma 
that we are now here with the dollar. Um, so I, I really think that what many people have been predicting, and that's that's what seems likely, and it's very uh, it's the history of the United States. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, it's all about you know uh, competitive markets and allowing you know private you know participants to to innovate. And I think like that, basically, you know, Bitcoin is always the the trailblazer um, and it's trailblazing. And then the, the, the private stablecoin issuers are trailblazing behind it. And then comes, you know, the dollar CBDC that is sort of like holding the knife, which are these private stablecoin issuers uh, trailblazing for them. Uh, so at the end of the day, it will benefit the dollar. And then at, at eventually the long term end of this is that we all know that, you know, this uh, fiat pegs, we hope. They're going to be temporary until we find some other pegged assets that we can start using with different communities. Not, not the entire com world needs to agree on the same peg. And that's a beautiful thing about decentralized markets. Uh, we can have different communities and then they all settle eventually on Bitcoin. It can be a barter economy at the end of the day. So that's why I find stable coins or pegged coins so, so exciting because we really don't know where they are. But where they are right now, it's in the middle of it. It's in the middle right next to CBDCs are as important as, uh, as Bitcoin, right? It's that battle that and, and stable coins are right there. So pegged assets are right there. Okay, let's talk a little bit more technically then about, about Babelfish. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong. So about two years ago, or maybe even two and a half years ago, uh, Edon contacted me regarding Cement Bell, uh, which was going to be a basket of stable coins. That was the first time uh, that I that I heard about the idea. Um, you've been working with Edon longer. Did this come out of the out of the Cement DAO uh, project? Because when I was talking to him, it was very much the conceptual phase. There were just a couple of engineers there, um, and then, as far as I'm I'm aware, you kind of like part of that original thinking, or or no? Yes. So. So there's no cement out technology being used on on Babelfish. Again, the markets were so different back then. Uh, so when when um, Yago was working on cement DAO, this idea of creating a stablecoin clearinghouse, because there were no lending markets, we had to create our own sort of like incentives. It was really cool um, to to get into that space early for me personally. Um, I got to basically while most of the research on the tech side was going. I went on and created sort of the first blog on stable coins, um, sort of identifying uh, for the first time, I think, in this space that, you know, if you don't do it, nobody else will. So um, so I identified over 100 something stable coin projects uh, that were working at the moment. Over 100? Over 100. Wow. In 2018, yes, over 100. And many of them, exactly, many of most of them failed, right? And that's a problem that we also, Bubblefish can also help um, you know, if there's demand that can be found for them, you know, and they can be added to the basket somehow. That's that's another thing. So there were over a hundred. What, what we're talking about is is stable coins uh, on a community level. Uh, we're talking about so uh, Bitcoin Beach uh, stable coin. There's a growing economy there, okay, and whatever, and they want to they want to be transacting so backed by Bitcoin. Um, and there wouldn't be enough liquidity for them, but because of the awareness uh, that we Correct. have, there could literally be a Bitcoin Beach, uh, a, a BBS, Bitcoin mm -hmm. Beach stable coin, backed by Bitcoin, that would then be part of this basket. And if that was sort of, if we percolated that out in, in the sense of ripples, uh, we'd have intersecting communities that have their own local, their own local currencies that are backed by Bitcoin, which then find pooled liquidity through the Babelfish money protocol. Is that a pretty accurate um, statement? I think that's a very cool thing that that that's like a dif another differentiator of Babelfish is that exactly that the Bitcoin uh, the Bitcoin pool for insurance that we have eventually um, may be large enough that it will allow us to do also cool experimentation with Bitcoin backed stablecoins and combine it somehow if they are earning yield um, on Bitcoin for example and sort of like integrate more easily. Cool. And what um, about the oracles? So, so you guys have an oracle implementation, as far as I'm, I'm, I'm aware, as well that that uh, that we're using. You want to talk a little bit about your oracle and where you're getting your data from and how that's implemented technically? Yeah. So, 
the technical side, there's another member um, on uh, on Discord, um, Dark Matter, uh, World Dark, um, and he's like more more a better person. He's been help, being very helpful um, in creating creating the basket, and you know it's an it's an old. Uh, he's a, he's a, he has he's a fish with gray hair. Uh, I would say. <laughs> I've team. got the gray beard. He's got the gray hair, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but something that I can tell you about why Babelfish, it's so cool for a multi-chain world or stable coins are actually the coolest thing for a multi-chain world. And I think Tether knows this secret for a while. It's that, you know, it's a dollar, right? So, so when you're just, when you're just a one, it's, uh, it just makes everything much easier than when you're a volatile asset. It's, much easier it's one of the few things world. that I'm willing to give Brock Pierce credit for is being involved with Tether. So, but elsewhere, I have a, a lot of, a lot of criticisms, but yeah, but one to one is is something in 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 people's brains, and and I have to admit, so from the beginning, you know, the amount of decimals, so the in the potential infinite divisibility of Bitcoin as a scarce resource, so we just increase the decimals if we if we have larger scaling, um, was always really interesting to me, you know. So and also watching people, uh, you know, thinking I can't afford Bitcoin because the price of one Bitcoin is, is out of my reach, whether it was at $200 or whether it's at, at $60,000. Uh, people can't get wrap their heads around the decimalization uh, of an asset. So I, I agree with you that there that, 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 that stable coins sort of make, make that, that, uh, that cognitive dissonance that people have with being able to calculate what is worth uh, as being something that will be driving crypto acceptance forward. Um, at some point, you know, the dream is that people aren't even aware that they're using Bitcoin. Uh, we've been talking about that for years. Um, uh, it's, it, it's been a goal and the current narrative is that stable coins will, will offer that because they intersect uh, with, with current understanding and current, current finance regulation more likely to, to be accepting uh, of, of um, uh, of stable coins as well, although they've been, you know, very, very cagey about it so far. But I think that Wall Street and finance will be driving them forward because uh, every every bank can have their own uh, stable coin that's backed by the reputation of their bank. Uh, and if you look at, I'm sure you listened a, a bit to to Smuggler's talk uh, before you came on, where he's talking about DBCs. Uh, and a system that the asset is not really relevant. What's only relevant is is the trustlessness and the privacy uh, and anonymity set of the transaction. Um, these are all things that seem to be coalescing into a direction that we're all discovering ourselves as well, right? Those, those of us that have been around in this, this space, it's been discussed, but it's it's also a discovery narrative, I think. I think that I think the next years are gonna be very, very messy. Uh, full of storms and potholes with with projects coming and going, uh, but it's interesting uh, and and actually really exciting to see the the debate shifting from layer zero um, and now on 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 layer two, um, and that's what fascinates me also about Sovereign is the is the composability, the EVM, uh, and all the things that they enable. I, I'm looking forward to a complete shift in the debate. Where we're, where we're talking about the relative merits and the trade-offs that each individual uh, asset is or chain uh, uh, is making. Um, it's a pretty, pretty rich ecosystem that's, that's developing in front of us. And, and as a mutant, as a Bitcoin mutant, you know, I, I find it all be incredibly exciting. What are some of the other projects in the space, uh, in, in the DeFi space, that, that you're also really uh, excited about which other protocols, uh, which other which other thing and projects that are happening. Well, there's there's plenty, but I'll go just from what you were saying here. It's 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 uh, you're right. It's about communities and shared agreements and and yes, exactly familiar currencies to be able to understand um, this great UI mobile apps that you know just so happen to use Bitcoin, right? So I was in Colombia recently, and there was, for example, this cool project. And that what they were doing, they were um, helping Venezuelan refugees send remittances to Venezuela, right? So Venezuela, it's kind of uh, counterintuitive, but it's one of the most banked nations in the world. 
because it was a wealthy nation until recently. Well, oil, oil country. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, but so the way it would do it, you would go to like a kiosk or even just send like a like a like a a, a wire payment, and then with Colombian pesos. And then what you would do, you they would use the liquidity in local bitcoins to buy Bitcoin, lock it at that price. And then basically that price, they would print it in the UI, they would show it in dollars, right? So for all they know, they're just exchanging pesos for dollars. And then they would send that um, via the same app to someone in Venezuela. And when that person in Venezuela wanted to claim those dollars, um, they would just go to local Bitcoin on the other end and they would sell that Bitcoin and they would ask the local Bitcoin um, uh, buyer uh, to send the money to an account and they would sort of like intermediate that. So. That's one cool example of what you're saying that people don't I always know. I, I, I really fun. wonder when people say, you know, governments are going to ban Bitcoin. I just like wonder how they can even possibly do it when you have 35 app developers. You, you know what I mean? There's always people that are developing their own local version. How it's it's literally I, I, where would you even begin as a government other than a blanket ban? And the blanket bans have worked incredibly well for prostitution and drugs, as far as I can tell, you know, so. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's financial apartheid. It's financial apartheid. And you see it in countries like Iran and in Venezuela, while the people that are in power. Power in Iran, right? Did you get that statistic last week? Which? 5% so of, of Bitcoin's hash rate is in, is in Iran. Okay. I did not know that. Wow. Right. And wow. that's just like if, if, if that isn't a proof of the American use case, I can't think of very many countries that have suffered longer uh, under financial sanctions, uh, American financial sanctions, except for maybe the Palestinians. Um, but there's there is Bitcoin's use case writ large. Here's a nation that has been made a, fi a, a pariah, a financial pariah with economic sanctions decade on decade. Um, and they're now essentially uh, monetizing their oil via Bitcoin. It's it, it, I, so I, I, I'm curious. How do you see the, see the future? Because everybody comes into the space and is like, okay, but it can get banned. The the likelihood of that happen seems to be shrinking and shrinking and shrinking for me. Other than on some sort of like moral level, yeah. Yes, well, this is a conversation that we can have forever, Excel. You know, this is a very a conversation that there's it has so many, so many, so many ways to go. But what I really find interesting is that you know, even Bitcoin maxis, you know, agree with stable coins. Like if there's one thing that they, they they're okay with Bitcoin, but then they will accept Tether, right? Because they understand it's needed. So I find that really well, cool. I think that so people are willing to accept Tether is because it's just a it's a non-volatile uh, denomination and you can you can move in and out of it it's just it's just like a you know it, it it's a bridge it's a bridge currency that you can look at and you go okay this this month i don't want to even look at my my bitcoin holdings you know because i've got rent to pay this month and so i'm just keeping that usdt on my metamask because i know okay this month regardless what happens i'm gonna you know pay my rent and my my gas bill and whatever so i think that that's that's pretty clearly established yeah yeah correct so 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 but yeah i just find it interesting that you know it's like you know like all this inflation a lot of flood of dollars it's sort of like the anteroom to hyper bitcoinization so before that we're sort of we're seeing for example strike here the historic announcement you know like we are helping um you know strike you're also using yeah you're using satoshi but you're also using stable coins if i'm if i'm not mistaken um so it's really interesting how they're complementing each other temporarily just because it's a familiar currency that we need for now until eventually exactly how the future will be. Uh, I don't know. Can it and can it be banned? I don't know. I think there's so many benefits for every government is benefiting from it. You know, you have in, in El Salvador, Bukele, he's a uh, extreme right wing. And then you have in Venezuela, Maduro and his extreme left wing. Um, what happens if he were to announce what Bukele announced, right? Um, so you have from both ends of the uh, of the spectrum. The difference is, of course, if apparently what El Salvador is going to do, and this is an important distinction because I do think there is, it's an important distinction. It's that you know nobody knows how much Bitcoin the the Venezuelan government is having. Um, nobody knows any data for about anything. There's been no official data about anything printed for for a decade at least. 
Whereas what uh, as mine, for what Strike wants to do in there, it would really provide transparency. So the whole point of what we're doing is transparency. We want cryptographic laws for lawless nations. And uh, I think, yeah, I think the future, the centralized future, it's, uh, it's chaotic, chaotic, but needs to be ruled by cryptographic laws. And I, I'm, I think we're entering a very interesting decade as China rises. And I see almost like Bitcoin because of stable coins that are, you know, dollar, the trusted network that is being hacked into a trustless network. I see almost like the dollar is ev visually, the dollar is evaporating into Bitcoin. And then Bitcoin is breaking into many pieces around the world. It's almost like an Amer the American gift of freedom. Um, the idea of American freedom is going to spread through the world as it should be, uh, not as it's being become. Kind of, if that makes sense. What a way to end! What a way to end, to, end, to, to close an hour. Yeah, I think uh, you know um, this this sort of uh, utopian uh, dreaming and and desire to in, improve the life of people uh, through through financial uh, services and cryptographic protocols is one of the things that drew me originally uh to the space this whole cypherpunks write code it's it's not just like going out there and and carrying a sign or or voting or whatever it's 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 truly a complete paradigm shift um in having a a, a consensus rule set that you can opt into rather being born into right so we're each born into um a set of, of fictitious borders where if you're even if you're Venezuelan, right, and your dad was Chinese and you were born in then America, you have that rule set that's just laid on you. It's it's a it's a very, very inter interesting um, limited civiliz civilizational development that it's an opt in system for 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 consensus or not. And the fact that uh, rogue nations as well as recognized nations, it's all permissionless, it's borderless. There's no one that can be forbidden in, in participating in the system other than by actual physical force. Um, and despite the wars that we see, you know, happening around the planet still, percentage wise, we have less people dying from wars and conflict now than ever before. Right. We're well, that's arguable because it only takes one big bomb to change that. Uh, I, I don't think that there's ever going to be that big bomb, but that's a discussion for another time. But I think I think that uh, that we are tending towards towards less actual uh, conflict um, civilizationally, and and having these this set of uh, transparent rules um, being part of the of the toolbox is is very very inspirational development. Yeah. Absolutely, I agree. I think that's the reason that we are all here for, um, and I think that's why you know. It's exciting to be part of this. It takes a few touch points. Some people, it's some, not everybody sees it immediately. Uh, but once you get it, you you never you never really go back. That's why it's called red pill. You literally, it really opens your eyes to the matrix to realize that everything we're just being programmed, and we need to be deprogrammed and recreate the world as we want it to be. And we do have the power with technology, which is something that economists didn't have before as a tool and all of these revolutionaries now we have technology to do you know something that that can be really can be really exciting and definitely very chaotic uh, but we're proving some something really cool here with sovereign yeah so i have a really interesting so we'll close this off with a question uh from the uh discord chat channel so everybody that's watching out there if you go to sovereignthon.sovereign.app instead of instead of youtube you have a live stream window by clicking on the button and you have also direct access into Discord chat. We're using Discord chat instead of YouTube comments because of all the spam that you normally see in those sort of things. Um, and also to help draw you into our community. <coughs> anyway, uh, somebody's asked in the Discord chat uh, if Babelfish will eventually evolve to have a savings feature like Anchor Protocol. So those are all questions that I would, I would say it's possible, but our focus is mostly on getting Bitcoin insurance and rewarding um, fish stakers. Um, that's, that's, that's our strategy to begin with, but this is the alpha proposal. And all of this, if you want to see something like this, once we have governance up, um, 
please propose your ideas why you think this would be preferred, uh, preferable to using Bitcoin, to using it to buy Bitcoin insurance, for example. So as a last thing, we got a couple more minutes. As a last thing, um, one of the things that's really cool about the Babelfish uh, community is the amazing art that's coming out of it. Um, so you guys had a logo competition that was really like, how did you settle on the one? <laughs> right? There were so many great, uh, so many great submissions for, for, for the logo. Um, incredibly active community. Maybe talk a little bit about, do some name dropping of some of the great artists that you have uh, in the community and what's going on. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I think the logo competition took place probably about a month since our, after our first tweet. There was just a lot of, of, uh, of buzz about it. The name and the idea really clicked with people to understand what we're building. Uh, plus, again, the different communities that we're bringing. And, you know, not everybody can code, but if you can't code, you can, uh, you can meme or you can write, you can do many things. And so putting the, the what do you think about Babelfish in one image really attracted a lot of people. We created a bounty. Until we have fish in the, the, the token generation event, we said, you know what, we need, we have a lot of community. They want to participate. How can we, because it's all about the community. Well, we need a logo, not just an, not just an emoji, which was a cool emoji, but we need a proper logo. Um, so we announced a bounty, 420K uh, fish for different tasks. One of them was for the logo. Uh, we were looking for different submissions and we said that, you know, we would reward the top three candidates. And we had just a flood. I think it was again over 120. Then someone else from the community, and that's very active, uh, Novax. Uh, he did like a gif of all of the sub submissions that happened in there. And then we had, for example, uh, Flame Tail. He's also very active. He was, was uh, sort of like doing sort of like you know the you know the competition, organizing it. And then Hyde, which actually is a community manager uh, that that we have. Uh, his logo won, right? People were saying, oh, this was probably corrupt, but no, I mean, the, you know, we can share, uh, Flamethill can share with you the results. So it's amazing that, that you know, even before uh, we have governance, we are really sticking with it. I had my favorite, you know, people in the team had their favorites. I had my own ideas. Um, but, you know, um, this part of democracy, we're trying to do as much as we can um, by opening up for a vote um not all decisions will be able to be put up for a vote but that was one one very uh great example of how we came with it i actually like it it's actually you know people were also proposing calling it xd um like uh, because it looks like a smile and because it looks like a fish too and it's cool it was kind of like the crypto fish uh, of the early christians uh, in the roman empire uh, <laughs> So fish, fish has a lot of symbology. Fish has a lot of symbology. So um, fish and space, we really love our brand. There's a lot to do together with Sovereign, together with, for example, you know, Tropicus Finance as well. There's many things happening in RSK. There's a lot, a lot, uh, a lot that can be done with uh, with the Bubble Fish brand and the community is super pumped. And uh, we're, we're thinking the things that we're talking about, people want to do sort of like a cypherpunk uh, style uh, NFT drop for, for everyone. So it's like pixelated uh, different types of fish because there's so many fish varieties. Um, there's many cool ideas. Um, we will see how we can bring it all together. But so far, Sovereign serves as a very good example of how to create um, order from disorder in a way. And you know, eventually the community understands that it's chaotic and it's a community that, that, that basically uh, embraces chaos, right? And uh, so long as you're doing that and you're willing to take the risk and really, you know, participate, um, people will notice you. I think what's really cool about the so both the sovereign and the Valfish communities is that the level of dialogue has a lot of uh, a lot of mutual respect. Um, you don't see flame wars and hate and uh, that sort of stuff. Is very, you know, a lot of it seems that we're people who are tired of the of the normal uh you, you know fighting elsewhere online or gravitating uh to to both our communities and that's really it's really inspiring so cool we got to change over to the next guest thanks so much for for joining us enjoy my thank you exile uh, i will i will see you online man thanks for coming thank you bye cheers